So what do bicycles and cloud architecture have in common? A lot, actually. Let's talk about it. Hey, greetings from the uh, CNO uh, towpath trail. Uh, beautiful day today, 60 degrees out here uh, doing some gravel biking and uh, decided to make a video and talk to you about how cloud computing and bicycles are related. Stay with me. So my gravel bike's over there. It's nothing special. Built it during the pandemic, probably uh, uh, put $1,500 into it. Uh, just commodity components, uh, which is perfectly fine for my requirements as a 62-year-old man who uh, probably puts about 2,000 miles uh, a year on a bicycle, which, as you know, is not a lot for people who bike out there. Um, but the idea was I built a bike for my requirements, and I made sure to stay within a budget, even though I could afford a $10,000 bike. Uh, I really didn't need a $10,000 bike. So that bike met my needs for the least amount of money. And that's where the value came in. So how is that like cloud computing? Well, what if that bike had a uh, front tire that was just six inches high, a back tire that was 40 inches around, um, no brakes, and it cost me $100,000? What would you think of that? Well, that's what many cloud computing architectures are like. In other words, they're wildly inefficient and they wildly are more way more expensive than they should be. And the reasons for that are we talked about on this uh, channel quite a bit. People overestimate, they overprovision, uh, they pick technology for the wrong reasons, uh, they make biased decisions, they don't look at the technology solution that's there. They just kind of get to the core metric that, well, this works, therefore it's a good architecture. That's not the case. Uh, the bike I just described to you with a six inch tire and the 40 inch back tire, no brakes, no reason why that wouldn't work as well, but it wouldn't provide the safety and the ability to have an optimal bicycle. And certainly you, you don't want to pay a hundred thousand dollars for something like that. So you get the analogy. So the idea is that when we do an architecture is that we look at the requirements in terms of what we need to build and we build the architecture around those requirements. And we do so with an open mind. In other words, we don't overbuild, we don't overspend, and we get to the closest architecture that's going to be as uh, mostly optimized as it can be. It can't be 100% optimized. We're never going to have the perfect solution. But there's so many architectures out there, so many cloud deployments that I see, certainly in the multi-cloud world and hybrid cloud world, where they're picking the wrong technology for the wrong reasons. Um, they may have skill sets in that technology. They may be certified as an AWS architect, and therefore they pick a pure AWS solution. Uh, they may be friends with the uh, sales rep for a particular cloud provider. Um, they may even have, be in a consulting firm, have a commission for uh, using one provider over another, or some sort of a benefit com that comes back if you're doing something like that. So... There's ethical and pragmatic decisions that kind of come into play when we pick and choose the architectures that we're bringing to bear to build and deploy a cloud-based architecture. And at the essence, we need to understand how to go through a process and how to go through uh, a set of uh, pragmatic assessments where we are able to consider the requirements and we are able to have an open mind. We are able to pick the technology that's gonna best fit 
the particular problems that we're looking to solve. And we are able, and this is very important, with are, are going to be able to have the ability to, to return the maximum amount of value back to the business. That's why we exist as architects. That metric is seen to uh, gone by the wayside. I'm seeing architecture after architecture, which is, you know, very similar to our hundred thousand dollar bicycle, which is overly expensive. Uh, it's not using technology in the right way. Uh, it's moving toward technology, sometimes brands or types of technology using religious fervor, not necessarily a pragmatic or a scientific uh, fervor, the ability to line up the requirements directly with the uh, with the solution. And businesses are ending up at a point where for every dollar spent on cloud computing, um, expecting to get at least a dollar back, maybe two dollars back, uh, they're spending $3 uh, in terms of uh, having the cloud computing solution take them further backwards in terms of their ability to automate things, where cloud computing, as we you know, talked about 10 years ago, should have been taking them forward. So that's where we are today in 2024. So what are we going to do about it? Well, uh, when you're in a hole, quit digging. So if you have a dysfunctional architecture, you're working in an enterprise that has something that you know is bringing up too much technical debt. Uh, it's not efficient. It costs too much. As I mentioned in my books, many times these cloud solutions are costing enterprises 2.5 times what they thought they would cost. And we saw these with some of the surveys that were brought to us in 2022, where people were just absolutely uh, surprised at the amount of money they were spending on cloud. So we can either move forward and continue on with those architectures and don't fix them because uh, they work, uh, but they're going to continue to eat money. They're going to continue to divert resources into areas that the business shouldn't be investing in. So keep that in mind. We're going through kind of a a bit of a transition now as we're moving from kind of the initial investments in the cloud and building cloud infrastructure into building generative AI systems on the same kind of infrastructure. So we have some decisions to make. Either we can move forward with the existing dysfunctional architecture, our $100,000 bike, or we can choose to fix the architectures before we start deploying these generative AI systems on them, the special databases, things like that. And that's really the challenge right now. My larger concern is that enterprises are going to uh, consider the transition to a new architecture as diverting resources that they feel they should be spending on AI-based projects. when. The fact of the matter is you're fixing an existing dysfunctional infrastructure to prepare it better to leverage a generative AI system and leverage it uh, in a way that's going to bring the most value back to the business. The fear that I have now is that we're going to go from uh, maybe uh, you know 50% uh, in incorrect inefficient spending to 75 or even 100% in inefficient spending and the fact that we're not fixing our architectures as we move to the next generation of technology, in this case, generative AI. Um, the other thing is considering all uh, technologies as being on the table. In uh, many cases, people are only looking at cloud-based technology. Uh, obviously, this is called the Cloud Insider Podcast. We talk about cloud technology, but the reality is that all the technology is on the table, whether it's edge computing, mainframe computing. We did a video on that a while back. and. It's going to be a ubiquitous world where we're going to leverage the appropriate platform for the solutions that we need to meet the requirements that we need. So even though cloud is going to be a viable option and certainly going to be a strong option in many cases, it's not always going to be the right option. And so people are often taken back by that. Um, but the reality is that uh, we're, we're kind of moving from a different paradigm where we're moving everything to the cloud to centralize the systems. If you remember the uh, battle cry 10 years ago was to consolidate uh, the applications and the data and everything on a public cloud provider to the fact that that cloud provider is not always going to be the most optimized solution that's gonna bring the most value back to the business. That may be our mainframe uh, where we keep our applications on, we run them till it's end of life. That may be an edge-based system. That may be traditional systems, lamp stack things that we find in our data centers. And now that we're looking to deploy generative AI systems, the same thing's on the table. Cloud computing is typically going to be 
the most convenient way to deploy and operate generative AI systems because the ecosystems are there. Uh, however, it's not always going to be the best value for what you're looking to do. And we may want to leverage on-premise uh, based generative AI systems, um, even though it's less convenient. If we're doing very simple things with that generative AI system, it may be the best value solution, or we may leverage alternate uh, clouds, micro clouds, GPU clouds that we're seeing today that are starting to rise up. So open your mind, keep everything on the table, make sure you look at this technology with a non-bias approach. And at the end of that cycle, you have to be very, have the courage uh, in many cases to admit that something has to be changed and you may have to go slower to go faster. And I think that's something that a lot of architects out there need to start doing right now because I think we're wasting a lot of money on using this technology inappropriately. So good luck in building your cloud architectures and I hope you find a, a good bicycle too. Well, that's all I have here from the uh, CNO towpath uh, near Port of the Rocks, Maryland. Hope you guys have a uh, good time. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, check out my book. Uh, check out my LinkedIn learning courses. Uh, check out my InfoWorld blog and uh, come back. I'll see you soon. Bye.